you read, probably you're allowed to be 50 people in here now, so I think it's great to have many people together and people talk. And Nicolas and Lars have set it up so we can Zoom, preferably even more professional than we normally do, and it gets better and better all the time. Uh, so today we have an internal, Rune Bell. Uh, and Rune got his uh, master degree here at the University of Copenhagen in physics and biophysics, and we believe it's uh, towards the end of the 90s, and he's not completely sure. Um, after which he went to the University of California, San Diego, worked with Professor David Kleinfield and Stephen Speck, who studied there in motor control of the whiskers of rodents. After that period, he went to the Veteran Hospital in Taipei, in Taiwan, to do a short postdoc with clients for injury with Professor Heinz Chang. I don't know none of these people, so at least forget their names. <laughs> And in 2004, he came back to the University of Copenhagen to work in uh, Hans Ola, and yet he did, took over my chair, we just talked about. I left the chair, I'm not <laughs> in it. Uh, so it's probably much better than I would have ever done in my physiology. Uh, and the intracellular recordings of spinal neurons in Perth. So in 2008, Rune received the uh, head of Miller grant and started working towards creating his own group. And uh, later on, he received the Sakai Outer grant as well. And in 2013, he became a tenured associate professor here at the Department of Neuroscience, or something else at the time. So Rune's uh, research focused on network approach to understanding the nervous system, especially the motor system. And we look very much forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. It's a great honor for me to be here in my own department. And having so many people is amazing. Uh, and also, uh, this is a, uh, a presentation of a, a, a new theory that uh, Hintleck and I have been working on uh, for a long time. I don't dare how to say how, how many years we worked on it but um, it's uh, finally coming together. So um, uh, if you're curious about this little video we have, it's, uh, it's just showing uh, uh, the, uh, the, ex the input to a network that, is, uh, uh, that can produce a motor program. And so the input is this broken line here, and then we have a couple of neurons selected from the population that is producing this rhythmic activity. And below here we have a, a uh, a uh, sorted representation of all the neurons in that network according to phase. And then at the bottom we have a, so we have a little output layer that is pr producing the, the, uh, the nerve output to two muscles. In this case, it's a flexor and an extensor. I'll get back to that. Uh, it's a model. It's a model. Yes, it's a model. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, so uh, uh, not so many people are familiar with uh, this field. So uh, rhythmic movements are something that we have studied for a long time. It's a, a way to characterize uh, several different types of movement, uh, locomotion, um, uh, scratching, and then breathing, and, and a number of other types of uh, so-called stereotypical movements. Movements that uh, are, are produced by a, a centralized circuit in, in the spinal cord or in, in, the, in the brainstem. Here's a review of, uh, of all the different types of central pattern generators. So this is, these circuits are called central pattern generators because it was discovered a long time ago that they're, they're, they're not dependent on, on central feedback from the periphery, which may seem trivial, but this is, uh, um, they, this, this is uh, it, it took some time to, to realize that. So we have uh, uh, different circuits here. And then um, if we, Okay, my, my cursor disappeared. Um, should I use this instead? Okay, but the, so the, uh, in particular, there's a, a, a famous region here called the mesencephalic locomotor region, which is uh, a region that if you stimulate it, it can activate a, a central pattern generator in the, in the lower uh, spinal cord, in the lumbar spinal cord that produce locomotion. And there's a couple of other uh, central pattern generators. Also, uh, the, the respiratory central pattern generators in the medulla. Um, so here's just a, so this is, I, I'm showing you this because I did this experiment. We, we stimulate the MLR in the, this is a rat, uh, ketamine anesthetized. And, and you can see the electrode up here. So it's in the mesencephalon stimulating. You get something that resembles, you know, rhythmic movement on one side. So the idea is that you have um, in the brain, you have some centers that can project down to the spinal cord somewhere where this uh, um, motor circuitry is located. And then the, the, the higher, the supraspinal centers can activate these circuits. Um, so 
understanding how these circuits generate movement has been the uh, uh, an over overall uh, overarching question for a long time and um, um, I'm not going to go too much into details about the, the existing hypothesis, just that uh, uh, it's generally categorized into two sort of, one is uh, relying on pacemaker mechanisms, so, set, so cellular properties in the cells sort of that can produce these pacemaker-like rhythms, which is uh, appealing because understanding how you get these slow rhythms, you know, that are on the timescale of locomotion is not trivial when you have spiking activity that is on a time scale of, you know, say milliseconds. Um, the other uh, sort of uh, um, the, the other idea is that it's a network oscillator, it's some some kind of network mechanism, and these two are not mutually exclusive. It's probably some something in between having, you know, cellular properties and then having a network structure or the architecture of the network. Um, I would say that that. Uh, the, the, the pacemaker sort of part of it has been the one that has been studied most intensively over the decades, whereas the, net, the network the network part has not really been studied that much. And that's, that's where this theory that we have been working on sort of fills a gap. Um, and um, uh, the, the, pacemaker, the pacemaker idea is popular because of some of the, the very simple organisms. So th this is a famous stomatogastric ganglion. It's a, it's a a group of cells in the stomach uh, of the uh, crustaceans in a lobster that is grinding food. And it's a very uh, simple and, and even modern. <coughs> and, and other people have uh, 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 demonstrated that the pacemaker properties are important in this. Um, uh, regarding more, you know, sort of mammals and vertebrates, it's been more difficult to, to demonstrate the importance of pacemaker cells. Uh, surely there are pacemaker cells. This is oh, this is covering the the reference. Uh, I should move. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, let me just move this bar so you can see the reference. It's a it's a really nice uh, review by Thogarty and Ha last year, uh, uh, sort of going through all the evidence for and and uh, potential candidates for pacemaker cells in the spinal cord, and uh, basically so far it's not been successful in demonstrating uh, any type of uh, particular cell that's responsible for, for the rhythm generation. And um, so I just want to bring the attention to uh, some cybergenetics from the, I mean, this is kind of a jump, but um, when, when you have a system that's supposed to be able to tackle different um, external challenges, um, there's a, a, a cybergenetics have worked on this for for some time, there's a, a famous Ashby's law of uh, requisite uh, requisite variety, which is a is if a neural system is able to deal uh, if it is to be able to deal with successfully with the diversity of challenges uh, that its environment produces, it then it needs to have a rep repertoire of responses which is at least as numerous or and nuanced as the problems thrown up by the environment. So. If you have a neural system uh, producing movement, then this neural system should have at least as many different types of um, activities as the uh, external environment requires for that organism to survive, basically. So that's called Ashby's law. And um, it basically works not only for neural system, it also works for other organisms, you know, bio biology and even, you know, uh, companies and that type of thing. So, or a, a soccer team, you know, you should have as many uh, strategies for defense as there are strategies for attack by the other team. Um, so, so uh, in terms of the, the the idea of pacemaker, so when you have the uh, this is a, this is a a, a baby or new, newborn uh, human that is producing this uh, stereotypical rhythmic movement. So you can you can believe that. Um, that pacemaker activity is, is is at least helping, you know, producing this motor activity. But uh, having more complicated motor activity, as here's a, a a soccer match where you can see that the locomotion is requiring very complex and combination of different activities that are hardly to believe is produced by pacemaker activity. So um, so I 
I hypothesize that when you have a very simple, when you have very few uh, motor patterns that is required by the external environment, for example, the crustaceans up here, the stomatic gastric ganglion is just requiring one type of motor output, either there's food in the stomach or no food. It's only two types of responses. You can have something that's very simple and, um, and therefore you can have, um, ah, it's too bad with this bar. How do I move this? Okay, I'll move it up here. Uh, you can have a pacemaker dominated with where reliability is very important. Um, and and uh, metabolic cost is also very important. So it has to be cheap in terms of the, the cost of producing that activity and the, the number of neurons that are required. Whereas when you're up here in more complex, uh, the, the, it's more network dominated and flexibility is required because they have a lot of complex motor activity and also the mass of the, you know, we're, we're quite heavy. So that requires something too. And we can afford to have a more complex motor um, network. Okay. So it's also uh, another thing that, that sort of this idea with the pacemaker uh, circuitry doesn't really address is the non-rhythmic movements, which are very, you know, even very common in our everyday, everyday life. Here's two examples. One is the, you know, t the tennis strokes. You just do one movement and that's it. It's the same muscles and the same motor neurons are producing movement and likely it's also the same pre-motor neurons. If, it if that wasn't the case, then we would have to, every time we learn a new motor skill, we would have to uh, acquire a new set of neurons and we don't, the number of neurons in the spinal cord are very um, uh, 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 limited. We don't have so many neurons. So the idea of having a new circuitry for every type of movement is sort of very hard to believe. So, and also here we have the simple reflex, the vestibular spinal reflex. It's, a, it's also a, a, a simple movement like turning the head, that type of thing. It's also produced by likely the same circuitry. So there's something that doesn't really make sense. And um, so to list up the open questions, how are the rhythmic movements generated? Um, how are they adapted to more complex situations? And how does this neural generator or the, the central pattern generator required for this encompass non-rhythmic movements? So these are all uh, open questions. And um, in terms of uh, approaching these open questions, there's a, a recent, I'm inspired by a recent book that came out last year, the Bursaki, Yuri Bursaki called the, the brain from the inside out. Um, so a traditional approach in neuroscience has been to, it's called outside in approach, where, where uh, psychologists observe a certain behavior or a mental state is either representation or um, uh, attention or uh, consciousness, that type of thing. And then based on that, go into the brain and try to look for correlates for this type of activity. And uh, the progress in this, with this uh, approach has been rather limited. Instead, what he argues is, uh, is that uh, to take an inside out approach where you collect experimental observation without any preconceived notions of what to expect, just characterize them, sort of find a, a set of rules for how neural systems work. And then based on that, build your theory that can generate the motor output. So I think uh, uh, this also applies to the spinal, spinal field where we have sort of watched or, or you know, from the outside look at the motor activity of a cat or something. And then based on that motor activity, make hypothesis about how the neural circuits, circuitry is inside the spinal cord. And then with this preconceived notion, go in, do experiments, and then try to uh, validate that hypothesis. Um, instead, I, I, um, I think we should try to, um, to collect all the data uh, without, any, without any sort of theory in mind, and then uh, try to find like a common set of observations and then build a theory based on that. Okay. Um, and it's also to, you know, Sherlock's caveat here, never theorized before uh, you have data invariably, uh, you will end up twisting facts to suit the theories instead of the theories to suit the facts. This was very easy for Sherlock to say. I mean, uh, it, he had to say it because it's very human to do this. You know, it's almost impossible not to have a, a preconceived idea about what to expect, but just, just to remind us that, that uh, we have to keep an open mind and, um, and let the data speak. 
So um, with that in mind, I'm collecting some facts that I've done in the motor system now, and I'm gonna make a list. And then based on that, um, we present the, the theory that Henrik and I have worked on, and then see how that matches with the data. How does that sound? Good, okay. Um, so we have facts of neural activity. So one, one thing, I mean, it's not, is pseudo random listing. So don't, don't put anything into the order that I list this. One is the wide phase distribution. And obviously I can't list everything because uh, I only have 50 minutes, uh, 40 minutes left or something. Um, so wide phase distribution, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, wide phase distribution is, uh, this was something that was observed early by Birkenflitsch uh, in 1978. He recorded or they recorded from a cat doing uh, um, fictive scratching. So they, they serially record from different neurons in the spinal cord and discovered that they have, if you normalize it according to the phase, they have this distributed, uh, oh, sorry, normalize it according to the rhythmic movement. So it has a certain phase according to how it contracts a muscle. Um, that these neurons inside the spinal cord has this very sort of even distribution of phases also O Young, uh, uh, some time later, sort of saw a similar um, evenly phased, even, evenly distribu distributed phase. This is uh, also CAT, um, but um, this was air stepping of a, a CAT. I think it was a DC therapy, I'm not sure. Um, okay, um, and also um, turtle and mouse. This is uh, uh, Paul Stein and, and his group working that discovered the same sort of, this is not the, this is a, a scratching of turtle, same type of um, almost even, there's a little bit of discontinuity, but overall, same type of picture. Same thing for, this is Mercado et al, 2015. This, I should say, this, these are motor neurons. So they're also, they have a little bit of uh, like clustering, but, but overall it's pretty evenly distributed, even among motor neurons. Um, so, so here's, uh, I don't know if the sound comes through, but this is, uh, this is our work. So this is from uh, putting multi-electrode arrays into the spinal cord of a turtle, producing rhythmic scratching. So, so down here, you can see these are all the sort, sorted neurons. They have the, um, it's about, I think, uh, like almost 300 neurons. And the, the spike activity uh, follow also this sort of evenly distributed phase relationship. And uh, so the, up here, you see the activity of the different electrodes. And uh, um, also you can see up here, this is the population firing rate. So this is, the pop, this is how much each neuron fire, fires over the population. What we discovered was that uh, overall, you see this is more or less a bell-shaped curve. And um, it's on a logarithmic scale, which means that it is close to what can be called log normal distribution. Um, and um, that sounds fancy. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit. But th these are just, uh, um, so wide phase distribution, firing rate, dis firing rate distribution is wide and skewed. That's what basically what a log normal distribution is. It just means that it's skewed towards zero with a very long tail. And um, so, th but this was just my observation here. So that's only one one uh, uh, experiment or one, one set of experiments in one group. So what does it look like in other groups? Have, ever, have, have anyone else looked at the distribution of firing rates in the spinal cord? As it turned out, not very many people have done that. And, uh, but we were able to find uh, three other groups that have uh, looked at the distribution. So this is, uh, uh, I forgot to say that this, this was Peter, Peter, Peter Peterson. Uh, who did this experiment, and this is, uh, this is our data. So you can see on the linear scale, it has a skewness towards zero. On a, if you transform that to a log scale, it's a bell-shaped curve close to a log normal. It doesn't pass a statistical test for log, log normality, but you know, for, for everyday sort of, uh, it, it's very close to at least. So um, anyway, uh, um, so, so uh, Peter Kirkwood uh, looked at back in the 80s, he also described this. It also has the skewness towards zero. Uh, this is uh, in the in cat in the respiratory system. Um, there's a Prut and Perlmutter model, model 
uh, looked in the, in the cervical spinal cord of monkey while they did the wrist extension flexion in a weak monkey. Um, and then there's uh, another group here that looked at mud puppy, which is a kind of salamander doing locomotion. So it's a tetrapod locomotion. They looked in the cervical uh, spinal cord and they saw this, again, the skewed distribution of firing rates. So even though these are just four, four uh, observations, they all point towards the same, which is a low, low mean firing rate with a long tail towards higher frequencies. No one else has looked at it. I haven't seen anyone report the opposite or anything like that. Um, anyway, okay. So um, I also want to say that because I also want to talk about some of the experiments that we do. We're, we're, we're looking into this in, in rat, so implanting uh, these multi-electrode arrays. This is a, a wake um, rat uh, locomoting. These are some of the units that we recorded. Um, experiments with Jasper Core. And uh, Nicholas Bertram is working on uh, improving the electrodes. So we have this uh, project where we make uh, micro electrode arrays made out of diamonds so they can become really thin down to one, one micron thick. Um, okay, so uh, the, next, the next observation I wanna uh, share is this uh, sparse connectivity. So uh, this is a, a experiment uh, that we published last year um, and uh, uh, the observation, the overall observation, I mean, don't put too much into all this, uh, these graphs. We just observed that, that uh, uh, these, this histology you can see on the right, uh, paired intracellular recordings. So we can see the, the sub-threshold synaptic input are remarkably uncorrelated. So that's basically what we see here. You can see these are two motor neurons that we see, they belong to the same motor pool. They have the same phase and everything but the synaptic potentials they got were basically uncorrelated. What does that tell us? It tells us that, that uh, they're getting input from different sources that are overall on the rate correlated, but individual synaptic potentials are completely different, which is so surprising. We couldn't believe it, but, but um, it tells us that, that the, the input is, is sparse. The, the, the pre-motor network is, is large, and the, the, the input is very sparse. It means that there's very little overlap in synaptic input between neuro, neurons. Okay. Um, and this is uh, another lab that has uh, done similar observations. This was a neonatal uh, mouse uh, doing fixed locomotion and then calcium imaging. And uh, they basically observed that uh, in that little window they had, it was about hundred microns. The neurons that were active were basically um, there, was no, there was no distance dependent correlation between their activity. And also they had a wide distribution of phases, you know, regarding what I said earlier about this wide distribution of phases. It's not like either on or off, it's like everything in between basically. Okay, uh, so sparse connectivity, we can add to the list, even though not that many people have looked at it. Um, Something that makes no sense The, 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 this experiment? No, the, 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 oh yeah. the, this, this was a calcium, calcium imaging. Yeah. They have a slower activity, so yeah. you can't really resolve synaptic input. So these were just the overall phase. Yeah. And what does that mean? That means that neurons that are right next to each other, they're not, they don't have this ver the same slow phase. I mean, there, there's no, there's no, uh, no systematic uh, like uh, um, um, relationship between the distance and then the slow phase. Yeah, which is surprising also, right? Not what you expected. Okay, um, so I, then I want to add uh, another list, another bullet to the observation, which is when you block inhibition, you see widespread synchrony. And this is um, some of the experiments that uh, that uh, Ole and Ole have done. <laughs> this is, uh, so here we have uh, where um, Collie and Smith, this is data from Collie and Smith. You can see this is fictive locomotion up here. So uh, you put the, on some neurochemical uh, that activates the nerve, you get this uh, um, sort of uh, fictive lo locomotion is called. They have alternation between flexor and extensor. And um, when you put uh, when they put the uh, bicuculin and strychnine, they saw this overall 
uh, synchronization. And, uh, and uh, Ola and his group did the same in, in Stockholm, uh, where they had the fictive locomotion, that's that what you see here. It's the, and then after uh, uh, you know, reducing the inhibitory activity, you saw this widespread synchrony between uh, different output. Th these are a nerve output from the spinal cord. So very nice data. And, uh, and other people have done that too. So this is one of the, the general observations. Um, so we, list that, we, we add that to the list, right? I should say that there's another observation that the, the time scale of the rhythm goes from, goes from being you know, a couple of seconds to maybe 20, 20, 10 to 20 seconds or something like that. So it's a factor of 10 slower. Okay. Um, so then I want to add another bullet here, which is uh, people have, when you look at the, the activity, it's both reciprocal so you have an alternation between excitation and inhibition in some neurons. And then there's a, a balanced input where you have a balance between excitation and inhibition. And uh, uh, this is some, something that had caused uh, uh, controversy or con controversy in the field. I, uh, this, is, uh, this is my work or our work where you have, a, um, this is the, again, the turtle performing rhythmic scratching up here. You can see that this is an intercellular recording. You see a zoom in here have this very high fluctuating membrane potential. And, uh, and the, the spiking is irregular. Uh, then when we block inhibition only on that cell, so the network is intact, but blocking the synaptic input to that particular cell, you get a slowdown of the membrane fluctuations. As you see, this is the same time scale. Um, and you have a, an increase in the firing. And you would only see this increase if there was a concurrence between excitation and inhibition in the control situation. So you take away inhibition, the membrane potential depolarizes, and you have an increase in the firing. Um, also, this is another um, uh, recording. There's a voltage clamp. Uh, the, 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 uh, those of you who know voltage clamp will see that the, it's a, this is a sign that you have both excitation and inhibition together, because if you clamp at, at, uh, at the, um, the membrane, you know, resting membrane potential. You have an, you have to have an um, inward, uh, sorry, an outward current to, to keep it there. Whereas if you clamp at zero, you have to have an, an uh, inward current to keep it there. So there's a concurrence of inhibition and excitation. And also, we, we this this issue about the irregularity, we we try to quantify that for for the whole population in those uh, where we have the multi electrode array, where we have a large uh, population spiking activity. You try to pop, characterize how how um, common this irregularity is. Okay, um, so we also have. I mean, this is. I hope this is not a marathon of data, but uh, this has been a little bit of an. Uh, you know, uh, it's very difficult to get this data about you know the network structure and the the activity of the excitation inhibition. Um, so another thing we did was uh, we had intercellular recording plus the multiple electrode array. So you can see here, this is about 300 neurons and then the intercellular uh, membrane potential of one neuron. So what we do is uh, a spike triggered membrane potential for every single neuron that spikes in the network. That way we could find the neurons that are inhibitory and excitatory. But as so the, four, the, 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 the blue traces here you see are those that were identified as inhibitory. You can see up here, it's a sample of one of the inhibitory. So it's a spike triggered uh, average membrane potential. It gives this uh, IPSP. So it's an in inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So those, those connections were inhibitory. And what we find is that we have both, uh, so the green, green, line, the green shaded area represents the on activity for that particular neuron. And we can see that most, or, or three out of four of these neurons were out of phase. So that's uh, the reciprocal activity. And we also saw that there was one of them that's more in phase. So we have both in and out of phase. Um, and then I should also mention uh, uh, Ole's, Ole Keen's work. Uh, back in the 2008, uh, uh, he um, did a similar measurement where he found, um, you can see that the, the, the excitatory input, which is shown here in polar plots, are 
uh, in phase with the nerve, whereas the, the inhibitory activity is, is more or less out of phase, sort of the, the averages are, are shown below here. Um, so that points towards the alternation, but it's, it also seems like there's a little bit of a large variability in, in the inhibitory activity. Um, I also want to show this um, uh, work by uh, Tim Mercado, uh, a guy I mentioned earlier. So what he did was, uh, uh, he was in Jessel lab back, uh, uh, back when Tom Jessel was still alive. Um, and uh, so what he did was he, he backfilled the motor neurons with chorotoxin B, which is shown in the red here. And then he had a transgenic uh, mouse strain, which is uh, an ingrail. Is a type of uh, or the uh, the, uh, um, the the V one uh, a type of interneuron in the spinal cord that's inhibitory. So he knows that these are inhibitory neurons, and uh, uh, so you see the green dots around surrounding these red neurons. So the green dots are inhibitory neurons that um, are, are uh, located at different places. So he was able to because it was expressing this uh, uh, calcium indicator, the G camp. It's the fluorescent calcium indicator. So he can monitor the, the activity of these inhibitory neurons as a function of time. And at the same time, he was able to record the, the nerve output because he knew what neurons he, or, sorry, what muscles he had back, he had filled with chorotoxin B. And those were the ones that are active in these uh, uh, vertical uh, blue lines. So you can see when the neurons fire, with respect to the phase of these contraction or when the motor neurons fire. And you can see that it's, uh, so, so these red and green lines are, he did some kind of clustering of, of many neurons. And, uh, and they're, they're fairly well correlated with the, with the contraction of the muscle. And uh, he, he did, uh, this polar plot tells you the population of neurons that he looked at are more or less, a majority of them are, close to zero, which is uh, correlated with activity, but you also have some that are out of phase and, and any, any other phase of the, that you can imagine between zero and 360 degrees. So that, that is in, in agreement with this wide phase distribution that I mentioned earlier. And also we have a, a variety of different timing of these inhibitory neurons. This was a, a, the ankle flexor and he did the same for the hip extensor and got more or less the same picture. Okay, so, um, so this is, uh, now we're getting down to the bottom. So we have irregular spiking. We have um, a both reciprocal and balance uh, between uh, excitatory and inhibitory input to motor neurons for the most part. Um, and these are, so the motor neurons don't really tell what the rest of the network is doing, but at least they can give a hint about the organization. So. Our hypothesis is that the motor network behind, uh, sorry, the, the network, the pre-motor network behind the motor neurons have to a large extent a balanced structure. And um, um, this is uh, based on, on uh, uh, sort of the uh, um, studies from the rest of the uh, neuroscience. Here's, here's some influential papers about, about um, uh, balanced networks. And uh, here's a uh, Carl von Rieswick and uh, Heim Sampolinsku had a very influential paper back in '96, where they discovered uh, the firing rate distribution had this skewness towards. Maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but it has this uh, skewness towards zero and a long tail, very similar to what we observe in the spinal cord. And uh, and also uh, another influential paper is Shadow Newsom. From 94, where they, they looked at this irregular spiking that people, if you put a, an electrode into, into the neocortex of a monkey or, or even a human, you will see this irregular spiking, very low, low rate irregular spiking. And this, this was a mystery to, uh, to neuroscience, uh, to neuroscientists for a long time until, um, until Shatner and Newsom came up with this, I, this concept of, of a concurrence of inhibition and excitation, because that way you can keep the, mem the mean membrane potential below threshold and only the fluctuations in the synaptic input make the neuron spike. And that causes irregular spiking and low rate spiking. So that, that could be explained theoretically 
in this way. And this has uh, since then been, been uh, demonstrated experimentally. Um, okay, so hallmarks of uh, balanced networks, irregular spiking, wide phase distribution, low mean firing rate skewed towards zero, i.e. log normal, concurrent uh, activity of ex excitatory and inhibitory neurons, um, and then uh, it's widely observed in the brain in the neocortex and is, is established as in theoretical neuroscience. So we can use some of the tools and some of the knowledge that theoretical neuroscientists have developed um, to understand the spinal cord. Okay, so designing a new theory. I just want to say because there, there are, um, so theoretical neuroscience um, and, and modeling has sort of a, a a bad reputation. Uh, and I think it depends on whether you make a good or a bad model. So uh, let me just say some of the things that I think make a good model or a good theory, I should say. Uh, so uh, the virtues we have for, for theories, I think is very important. Uh, simplicity. This is uh, actually, <laughs> Einstein is uh, quoted for having a, a saying that a model should, or it should be as simple as possible, but not more simple than that. And uh, so simplicity is, uh, is good. And then also predictive power. Um, the power of scientific theory is the potential to generate testable predictions. So if you can't predict anything, then your theory doesn't really add anything to. So it, it's not only reproducing experimental observation, it should also test or, or predict something that we can then test in experiments. Um, and then there's uh, Occam's razor or the, the, the the law of parsimony. So the, uh, the theory should have the fewest amount of assumptions. And if you have, if you have a new theory that can, that can explain something that an old theory can also can explain, but the new theory has fewer assumptions, then, then that should be the, the, the favor, uh, favorable theory. The, the, the one, one with the fewest assumption is the most favorable theory. Okay, and then it has to be uh, falsifiable and well-defined, so no black boxes or anything that is not explained. Um, and this is to avoid the, you know, the famous not even wrong by Wolfgang Pauli. So uh, it should be that a person in, you know, if, if Henrik and I would have a theory, it should be that someone in Germany or, or in, the, in the, the UK or in Spain can take that theory and, uh, and put it into a computer simulation and, co and come arrive to the same conclusions. So that's a well-defined falsifiable theory. And then also I think biological, biologically plausible is an important, but that, that's just ill-defined. What, what does that mean? It's kind of the thing that when you see it, you know it um, kind of thing. Okay, um, so, so uh, the, our theory is, uh, we call it the balance sequence generator. It's a sparse random network. Um, uh, it has recurrent excitation and inhibition, also known as balanced network. Um, it's rate-based rate, it's rate activity. Um, and we also test it with and without adaptation and sort of pacemaker-like activity. And then the, the overall drive to this network uh, and gain uh, can be modulated sort of like an, a super spinal input. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about uh, the connectivity matrix. So the ne a network is really a, 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 um, a group of neurons that are connected to each other. And that's to describe the connections between a group of neurons is, is rather difficult. And a tool we have is what's called the connectivity matrix. And what, what that tells you is, let's say you have three neurons here. So you can make a matrix here, you say A, B, and C. And uh, A is connected to B, so that's why you have a green square here. And, uh, and, and uh, B and C are connected like this, so they're, they're connected to each other like this, or it, they have green squares here. So that's the connectivity matrix. But if it's not all, you know, either one, if it's not digital, if, it's, if, it, if some of the neurons can have a strong connection and some have a weak connection, then it makes more sense to have the numbers. So you just say there's a, zero here and then there's uh, maybe a 0 0.3 here and, and 0 0.5 there. So that way you can have the, the strength of the connection included in the connectivity matrix. So the connectivity matrix is important for when you want to understand networks. But the dynamics is also important. And uh, so here, 
we try to make it as simple as possible, but not too, but not more simple than that. <laughs> um, so, so if you had, so these are the, this is the dynamical equation at the top. So that's for neuron I. So we pick one neuron and we describe the dynamics of that neuron. And it looks complicated, but let me just explain. So the first term here, that's sort of the, that's a, that's a one compartment uh, neuron. So that's just the stability. So this is the internal st stabilizing uh, term. And then you have synaptic input. That's a sum of all the different synaptic inputs with the connectivity matrix. And then multiplied by the firing rate of that pre motor pre uh, pre synaptic neuron so that's the f that's the the firing rate function that is a, a function of the member potential of that neuron um, and then we have a, a adaptation term here in the end and then the the ie is the external drive so that's the input from let's say the brain or something and um, and below here this is the adaptation equation just you can just ignore that for now okay um, so having this, uh, this connectivity matrix, we can have, it turns out that the, what's called the eigenvalue spectrum is very important for understanding the dynamics. And the eigenvalue equation gives you the spectrum. So that's what, what we've written here. So W is the, the, the matrix. And then you have the, these X, Xn and the alpha, uh, lambda N, th those are the eigenvectors and the eigen values. So the eigenvalues, uh, a sample spectrum is shown over here to the right. So they can have, they can be anywhere in the complex plane. So you can have eigenvalues of this matrix that are complex. I know this is a mathematic, I mean, this is not supposed to be a course in, in high school mathematics, but um, so, so just trust me, you know, it can be, they can be com complex. <laughs> Um, and, and the dynamics of the whole network can be, be described as this. This is a V, v dash here is, a, is a, just a way of, of writing all the different membrane potentials, the membrane potential of all the different neurons in one vector, right? That uh, changes over time. And then uh, we have, and it turns out that the, it can be described as uh, the exponential with the eigenvalues here, time uh, an initial condition here, and then the the eigen vector of, of that particular eigenvalue. And this is, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, 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 my plan was to develop a, a intuition about how this works. So, okay, but th this is, uh, the, uh, basically this is uh, understanding the population dynamics rather than the single, single neuron activity. So this is a, a new sort of new trend in, in, in neuroscience that has appeared over the last 10 years. So there's um, a review uh, this year about the, the, the trajectories, the neural trajectories in of a population of neurons. So you can have, it's illustrated here in, in B. Uh, so you, you can have the, where, where the different vectors are the different, the, the activity of different neurons. So it's a, if there's N neurons, it's an N dimensional space. So you can have the activity of, of all the neurons and you can have these, the, uh, represented by a trajectory in neural space. Um, it sounds really fancy, uh, but, but um, uh, basically it's this equation that you, you change as a function of time, and then you get a trajectory in neural space. And this is important because these are different, um, these different eigenvectors, they represent different modes of that network. So you can have, you can have uh, multiple trajectories and, and that will give you mo uh, different types of output if it's a motor system. And also there's this manifold hypothesis that they, 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 they're, they're different manifolds in, in the space. And then um, the, the activity is, we should think of neural activity as being on a manifold in space rather than being represented by the activity of in individual neurons. Okay. Um, uh, yes, this is just this is just how how uh, complex numbers work. So uh, if you have the complex uh, the complex unity number i, and you write it in an exponential, it's the same as having the cosine and then this the sine. So these are oscillatory terms. So that means that this is this is how the oscillation comes in in the network. It, it it's from this um, this relationship. 
And also you can have the, if you have a complex number written as A plus IB, you can, you can separate that up into a, where, where A is the, is the real part and B is the imaginary part. You can write that up as, as A times T, if it evolves in T. So you have a exponential increase and then you have an oscillatory term. So, so let me just, I try to make a tutorial of this. So this is the eigenvalue space. Um, and, uh, and you see that if you're close to the stability line here where, where, the, where the, the, the real part is zero, um, then, then, then it's stable. If it's, if it's to the left, then the, you have this, this term dominating, it's the e to the minus and then the eigenvalue here. So it, it decays exponentially. If you're to the right, then it's positive all of a sudden, and then it's unstable, right? So then it grows exponentially. If if it's if it's away from the from the x-axis, then the the exp the imaginary part is is not zero, and then it starts oscillating. So that's what you have up here. And if it's if it's to the right of the stability line, then you have an increasing uh, an oscillation that increases in size. If it's to the left, then you have a decreasing oscillation. So it goes to zero, right? If you're close to this, if you close to this dash line, then you have a, a, a constant oscillation up here. I hope this kind of makes sense, but um, okay. It's just uh, so you, you get an idea about it. So let's explore the model. So first of all, is it, uh, is it possible to oscillate? We tried that out. So again, this bias in the way, but the, uh, I can't even remember what I wrote, but but um, um, oh, the rhythm rhythm can arise when changing the gain. So if we imagine that there's a supraspinal input going down to the spinal cord, you have a motor network in the spinal cord, and uh, this motor network is changing the the gain of a of uh, of neurons down there, and that's what you see in B in Figure B. So you can see there's three cases. The the blue has the least gain. Uh, red has higher gain and green has the highest gain. And what, what you see here in, in E and F is the one with the lowest gain, the blue one. You don't have a rhythmic activity, you just have a constant firing rate. Um, and then as you increase the gain, you can then you start having this oscillatory activity. And as when you increase it even more, then it starts falling apart and become chaotic. Um, okay, so the conclusion from this is yes, we can we can get an oscillation from this network. Okay, so this is um, um, this is uh, um, this is basically the same. So he, so here we have the, the the dash line. This is the movie I showed in the very beginning. The dash lines represent the input from let's say MLR, the the mesencephalic lo locomotor region. When you increase that, then you you change the drive. You, you change the drive to these neurons, so you also change the gain a little bit if the if the if the, if the input output function is has a, a curvature, and uh, and then you start seeing this rhythmic ac activity. And what you also see is this phase activity that's widely distributed. And this was this is uh, very similar to what we see in experiment. Uh, let me get back to that. But you also see when we have a we, we take an output layer. And 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 um, show that. So we take a selection of these neurons here, and and then we transform it into a uh, a nerve output. So that's what you see at the bottom. And let me just uh, show. So this is uh, the, the same model that I just talked about here, and this is the experiment that we showed in in the turtle. So the the multi electrode recordings here. You have these these waves that are, are come. It's like a sequence. So you have a sequential activity throughout the network. And then, um, uh, and there, therefore you have these different phases and then the motor, motor neurons receive a subset of these, uh, the, the activity from these neurons and then produce that motor output. That's what you see here. And in the model, we do the same. So that, that's what you see on the left and they're remarkably similar. So um, I just wanna uh, move up because this is just one behavior. We want to get to understand multiple behaviors and even non-rhythmic behaviors. So, um, but just uh, looking more at this uh, eigenvalue spectrum. So that's what you have here. So the, the one in A is, is, is a balanced network like, like the one we showed before. 
And, and let me just say that this rhythmic activity is completely without pacemaker activity. Any type of rhythmic activity in the single neuron, it doesn't have to be there. You can, you can have rhythmic activity regardless. But if you add, if you add let's say adaptation or, or pacemaker property, what, for example, if you have NMDA, 5-HT and so on, it moves the eigenvalues away from the x-axis upwards here. And what that means is it becomes more rhythmic basically. So, so having pacemaker properties help producing the rhythm. It makes it more rhythmic. Um, so that explains why you could have, a, let's say, a baby that needs to produce rhythmic activity, that it would be helpful to have pacemaker properties in, the, in some or maybe even all of the neurons. Uh, but another thing is that if you, if you add, if let's say you, you, uh, you want to block or, or reduce the inhibition, what you get is a, a, a mode that's, that's positive. So it's in the unstable territory. And uh, so this is the, the one in C is with pacemaker activity and the one in B is without pacemaker activity. You get these, uh, um, this mode and eigenvalue that's far into the unstable uh, regime. And uh, uh, let me remind you the, the activity that I showed earlier. If you, if you reduce, if you reduce uh, inhibition, you go from having something that alternates into having something that's synchronized. Um, and this, this is one of the very established facts. So we tried to do that in the same model. And um, this is what we saw. So uh, on the left is the control situation. So we have a, a, a network producing the rhythmic activity. You can see it at the bottom, it's alternating here. And then uh, these are the, um, in, 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 in A and B, uh, you can see the, the a, a bar graph showing the amount of excitation and the amount of inhibition. And then when you add bifuculin, strychnine, and picrotoxin, I mean, we didn't do this in the computer, but uh, sort of, sort of, <laughs> we didn't add strychnine on the computer, but uh, um, reducing the amount of inhibition, you get this widespread synchrony like you see down here. And, um, um, and it's due to this, I, I put a little red arrow here on in B to, to illustrate that it's this single eigen mode that's on the left, on the right, that's very unstable because it's far into the unstable territory. And that's the one that's dominating here. So why do we have a, a widespread synchrony when, I mean, it's, it's not, well, okay. Um, yeah, so, so what we think is happening is that you have, when you have a, when you have a, a, a recurrent network, when you have a recurrent network, you can basically treat that as a branch, like a tree-like network to some extent. And this is uh, what people have done um, in, in the theoretical studies. And um, um, so you can have, if, if there's a, 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 high, a low probability of, of one neuron activating the, the post-synaptic cell, you'll have what's called a subcritical uh, wave. Uh, but if there's a high probability, then it's a supercritical. It means that one neuron that activates three neurons will again activate three neurons and so on. And then you have an exponential growth in activity. And, and we believe that's exactly what happens. And then, I mean, this, this uh, spread of activity is so fast. I mean, it's action potential so propagates. It's within milliseconds, uh, tens of milliseconds. So that, that way, the whole network synchronizes. And what happens, the reason that, that we have this, uh, the, 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 C, uh, the, the seizing of activity is because of adaptation in the network. So they eventually they start firing so much and then it becomes higher and then it shuts off. And then eventually it recovers and then a new cycle comes. Okay, I also, I mean, I want to also show this to, uh, because both Ole, both Oles are here. <laughs> Uh, uh, not for nostalgic uh, reasons, but uh, um, this is a, a very has been a very influential study back in the 90s, uh, where uh, Ole and Ole put a, a, a spinal cord in a chamber. They put uh, um, NMDA and 5-HC, and the and the and the network started oscillating. And the, I should say this is on two different time scales. So this is on a slower time scale, and this is a fast. And you see this alternating activity that resembles locomotion. So, um, but, but I'm not sure anyone has really understood this like initial part and what happens here. But uh, oh, uh, we think that 
what what you have is you, you go from having a network where there's you know before you before the, they put on um, neurochemicals the 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 eigenvalue spectrum is to the left oh sorry yeah left and then as you put on neurochemicals you move it to the right you it becomes more unstable and then also it pushes it pushes the the eigenvalues up on the oscillatory territory and then it starts oscillating. So that's where you see that. So anyway, it's just a, a speculation. I don't know. Um, okay, so what about different motor programs, uh, which is a very important part in, 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 if you want to understand, it's the same network that's producing the output. So uh, I want to also, uh, since we have uh, uh, you guys here, <laughs> um, like um, this is very nice work done by Roberto and, and other uh, um, uh, in Stockholm, and uh, what what you see is uh, when you when you activate the the cuneiform and the and the PPN, you get different gates of activity. So one is either uh, walking or trotting, and then galloping, and and um, so so the the presumably the same network in the spinal cord is able to produce a very different motor output, and how does that take place? So I also want to show this is a more, so let's say this is from the turtle. It, um, and, and you can see that the, the uh, Paul Stein recorded uh, the motor output from a, a turtle producing different types of motor pattern. And what you see is that the, uh, the, the, the nerve activity is switching phase. Some of the, when, when the turtle is scratching either with the leg, uh, if it's something in front of its leg versus behind its leg, have, it has to have a different sequence of contraction. And this different sequence of contraction is, uh, you can see that as a representation of, of all different types of movements that we, we uh, are faced with. And this has not really been understood how you can have this different, different sequence of activity. But um, so what we think is, is happening is that if, um, let's say you have a uniform gain of all the neurons illustrated here. So uh, then you have a certain spectrum of eigenvalues and eigenmodes here, but you can also selectively change the gains of particular neurons. And then you get a completely different set of eigenmodes. And that means that the, the, the activity can be changed. And how could this be done, you know, regarding biological plausibility? You know, how can you change the, the, the modes of the network? So, so uh, we believe that, you know, you can have, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the anatomical projection from supraspinal input, the, the projections do not project to very many neurons and they do not project to the motor neurons. They're primarily the interneurons in the, in the, in the locomotor circuitry. And, and this, if, the, if it's selectively changing for a particular motor uh, behavior, then it could, it could change the eigenmodes um, to, to, for a specific motor pattern and then when another pattern is to be produced it can activate a slightly different set of neurons or, or um, premotor in, interneurons and then change the the eigenmodes of that so and and doing that uh, you know, this is just an example to show two behaviors and um, what you see here so this is the this is a, a triphasic uh, activity here you, you have here and uh, so you see that's a sequence contractions here that are sort of um, um, uh, like uh, like this and then over here activating a different different set or change slightly changing the gain of a different set of neurons you can have a change in the sequence of this so so this is how we believe it's being done so changing the uh, it's slightly changing the, the, the gain of a selected group of neurons, you can, you can induce a, 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 a different sequence of activity. Um, and uh, this also goes for non-rhythmic movements. So, so if, you, if you want to activate a sequence of activity for let's say uh, stroking a tennis ball, uh, then what, like the one versus another type, then you're activating a different sequence, but maybe just one cycle or something like that. So, so this can also explain non-rhythmic activity in the same network. So in conclusion, uh, we, uh, I've been presenting uh, our new, new theory, we call it the balanced sequence generator. It's consistent with experimental data. 
um, also data that no other theory has been able to explain. Um, and um, uh, it not only explained rhythm generation, but it also explains multifunctionalism and non-rhythmic movements. Uh, I also done this sort of pseudo comparison between there's something called the half center model and the universe generator, and then our uh, balanced sequence generator. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, so the okay, I, I just yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I just want to uh, um, emphasize the work by Henrik Lindin, who's sitting over there. Uh, he's done a lot of um, excellent work developing this theory. And then, but also the rest of the lab, uh, Beatrice, Jasper, Nicholas, uh, Jakob, Elias, and Christian, and past members. So, and of course our funding uh, over here. So thank you, I'm ready to take questions. They were also talking about the digital and feeling inspired presence. And he had this concept of reverberating presence. And I'm thinking when I'm looking at, at your stuff, it's really, I mean, for example, that would explain, I mean, we have a reverberating circuit method, which means that group A excites group B, that excites group C, that excites group D, that excites back to group mm -hmm. A, right? Yeah. Then you would. And we will have to build in some delay and some tenacity in the individual groups so they will be able to feed or something. But that would actually result in a distributed space, right? Yes. So is it fair to say that you've probably been working more on the rhythm generator than the pattern generator? And and that's one question. And the other is when you, you have to build this network, call a random network, you say that leaves eye value, and I don't understand that particularly. Yeah. So you say that it's sort of representing a neuron. So, so you have in some way built a neuron in that way. Now, how, and, and you say it's random, is it random and also in terms of synaptic interaction? I mean, in some way, you must, I mean, I, 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 so, so, so the, 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 the big issue here is the connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to what extent is this really? Um, and, and, so and also, it's also like, how do you, I mean, you should, Preferably, instead of building a model that you, uh, you have a biological system to understand, and then you build a model. And preferably, you should, I mean, should be able to least able to understand that. So, I mean, how, how do I understand if you go back and look at network connectivity and the way with neural input, how do you explain what you see in the model? Um, what, what is a critical issue in, in your, in your senior network that gives it all those nice characteristics that really are very similar to the biological system? Because that's really what we want to know, right? You want to go back still at some point to go back to the spinal cord. So you want more analysis and then... Uh, then I just I'm... want to understand how your network is composed in terms of connectivity and synaptic uh, Science, it's either inhibitor. I mean, we have a basis for reverberating. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, that's the key. Like, it, you ask the first question you ask, uh, uh, you know, this reverberating, whether we're really studying the rhythm generator as opposed to the pattern generator. Yeah, our, our point is it's the same thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, it's not two separate, uh, it's, no. it's the same. Yeah, uh, the same yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but. And, and regarding the, the information about the synaptic, I mean, we, uh, we, we use, we, dip, we, we generate the network based on some statistics and we have to make some guesses about the statistics because we don't, we only know a very tiny little bit about what's going on. And, and that's why we have to make some guesses. But um, I, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we have to make guesses basically. When, when we have so limited amount of data. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be possible to be more controlled and, and still, like you said, for example, this reverberating circuit thinking? And you can choose some randomness so it looks biological to me. Uh, Could it be more controlled? It's just like, I mean, it's, it seems like 
you're leaving a lot to, to back, you don't, I mean, I, I, how can you, how can you, if you don't understand how your network is generated, then for me. <laughs> But we are, I mean, we, we built a network. We understand how it is connected, yes. But we understand it. what is critical in the way the network is built to generate the output. I guess that's what we really want to know, right? Um, what's critical? I mean, that's a difficult question to answer because we can't, we can't generate all types of networks you can possibly imagine. That's impossible. I mean, you can't take every statistical type, any type of statistic and, and, and test it. It's just that I saw the way, I'm, I'm going to show up very quickly and also get a chance to <laughs> But I just saw that the critical point about making a model is to figure out when it doesn't work. I mean, in other words, that, yeah, what are the critical I mean, that's that kind of what we have there? That's kind of what we try to do here, for example. Yeah. You see, you can see, we, we know that, that what, I mean, um, I mean, maybe I didn't say that this clearly enough, but the, the 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 eigenvalues have to be close to the stability line to get rhythms. If it's too much to the the right, this the the network becomes unstable and you get these massive explosions type of uh, you know the strychnine bicuculine type of activity. Yeah. Or if it's too much to the right, it just becomes quiet. You know, it just dies out. But how does that translate into it doesn't really depend that much on con connectivity. It's, I mean, this, this is like this, the, the eigenvalue spectrum is telling you the connectivity. If the connectivity is not so that the eigenvalues are close to stability line, you won't get anything. So you have to change the connect. Okay. <laughs> you have to change the connectivity so that. I think maybe you did. I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but I feel that you are cherry picking results um, disregarding a lot of the features of this session. Uh, but we can leave that for now. Mm -hmm. But you have a kind of less informed uh, audience. So I feel that you made some statements that are very strong yeah that need to be qualified yeah i don't have confidence but the other issue is about models you said are very strong strong to say about what a model should be uh, and all of us that have been working in models know that you can get an output that would be good thing it's actually one of the most easy things mm -hmm. in the network and I don't see what the predictions are from this model about biology or anything about what is in the brain that is not obtained by other models. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can tell me what is exactly the prediction that this model does. And it's related to what all is saying. I mean, you can make, Imana has made. A whole range of models, there are 25,000 different models that can model the, the idea. Mm -hmm. So, how much of this that you put into the model is essential to the output? Yeah. It's, it's a very good question, and uh, it, it is hard to, to think of the like how to test this. How do you test this? Because it's, I mean, you say you have a new theory. <laughs> I put it, I, I got up on a high horse and then I got down again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have not seen anything here. Any predictions? Any predictions yeah. that make this a new theory. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we have. We, yeah, I mean, we have to take it one step at a time. I mean, but, but we. Yes, yes. I mean, um, he has to be able to enter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we have, I mean, that's part of the, some of the experiments. I, I you know, where uh, Jasper is uh, working hard to, you know, um, um, this um, uh, the rat, the rat experiments what we're doing. That's part, part of that is testing these um, theories. And, and one of the, one of the, 
um, one of the, I mean, it's a little bit like um, the philosophy of science, you know, if you want to test something, you can't just test one theory, you have to test against something else, right? You can't, I mean, you have to say, you have to have a null hypothesis. And, and to, in order to have a null hypothesis, you have to, you have to define it so well that, you know, you can, you can see what the outcome would be. And I, we just found it very difficult to find that null hypothesis in, in the existing literature. Uh, I mean, um, you know, the half center model and like there's so much that are undefined. So it's hard for us to really like, uh, uh, to really have it, uh, uh, I mean, I can, you know, some of the things we can, uh, I mean, some of the tests that you can do have already been done, you know, and then the half center model has been rejected and that type of thing already many times, right? Uh, so it's a little bit like, um, but, but we have some ideas. We have some, for example, let's say you want to turn this system on, like that transition where you're going from quiescent to active, that can tell you whether this is the type of system you have, right? And that's what we're doing. And, and uh, as opposed to, well, I don't really know what else to test, you know, like what other hypothesis would be, but yeah. I don't know anybody that Yeah. I don't know anything. So, so what you're saying? You, I have no. I mean, that's not me. Right, right, right. Nobody works on that. So, no, so what, what? So basically, what you're saying is there's no theory. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that nobody believes that believes that six mega neurons are generating algorithms for locomotion. It's not. I mean, neurons have a negative show. Yeah. I guess that what happens in neurons. Mm -hmm. So what if they don't believe then if they don't believe that what do they believe? But with identifying neurons there are different types of neurons in your body called with those different things. You have a cytochrome neurons, an endocrine neurons, and because it will get the different motor neuron tools, they will have different phases because they're active in sexual phase and I mean, just having sex or center phase is an inhibition expectation, and therefore you have a distributed phase curve. In your model, you don't identify any neurons, you just have all neurons being unidentified. So they can fire, they can be inhibitory, they can be excitatory. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could put in some restriction in the model to try to define whether that excitatory inhibitor. I mean, we, we know what cells are inhibitory and excitatory in the model. Uh, let me show you. And this will be the last time you're way over time. Yeah, and okay. I will enjoy that beer that you guys are having. So just a brief answer that I think we'll uh, call for it. No, I was just, I mean, I mean, we, we know, we know what we put into the model. This is like, like this is the matrix up here. So we know what I excited to and inhibitory. But we don't put anything more into it because of that, you know, one of the virtues was simplicity and 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 uh, the the Occam's razor, like the the law of parsimony. Like we don't put things in that we we don't think is necessary. If we don't have to, we don't put it in. Lovely with an interdepartmental debate. So thank you very much, Mona, and yeah. you guys. <laughs> <laughs>